Moving on, let's go to the final one. Now let's work through problem 16.39. It's also in this other book, which is online, which I have a copy of here. You might want to write this problem down, as I said before. I'm going to make a change to the problem, though. I'm going to change some of the information they give you. We're not going to quite answer the one they ask. We're going to answer a different one. It's this one right here. We're doing multiple, we have m multiple products. We have two products here, and we're doing break-even analysis. And we're going to also look at operating leverage. So they produce two types of weight training equipment, the J-Flex and a set of free weights. So I guess we should... Before we even work anything in this problem, let's we're gonna let Q1 equal number of J flex machines produced and sold. Remember with CDP analysis we assume that the company sells what it produces. There's no excess inventory. And Q2 equals the number of free weight, number of sets of free weights that the company produced and sold. So they have two products, one J-Flex machine or one set of free weights. All right. Now, the J-Flex sells for 200 bucks per J-Flex, and the free weights sell for $70 per set, $75 per set. So that means that P1 equals 200, and P2 equals 75. Now, the information I'm going to change is this information right here. They give you a projected income statement right here, but they give you these kind of weird numbers. I'm just going to change these numbers so that our final answers work out as whole numbers and they don't, we don't have to do any rounding and decimals. I'm just going to change the uh, income statement they give you. So sales, variable expenses, uh, so sales minus variable expenses is our contribution margin, then we subtract our fixed expenses and that gives us our uh, profit. So I'm gonna just I'm just gonna change the numbers, and the numbers I'm gonna use for sales I'm gonna use six hundred thousand. For variable expenses three hundred and ninety thousand. For the contribution margin then that's two ten. For fixed expenses we're gonna say one fifty seven five hundred, and that means our profit is fifty two five hundred. So replace their contribution income. Contribution format income statement with this one. This is the one. This is the information we're going to use. So we call it new given info. We're going to keep this. We're going to keep that. We're still selling each JFlex for 200 and each set of free weights for 75. Everything else in the problem is going to be the same except for this. This information we're going to change. So you can just scratch this out right here. This information. So this this then is a projected income statement for the upcoming, is it month or year? The upcoming uh, year right here. Now, they give you some more information. It says right here, the owner of the company estimates that 40% of the sales revenues will be produced by sales of the JFlex, and the remaining 60% of the sales revenues will be produced by sales of the free weights. The JFlex is also responsible for 40% of the variable expenses. And then of the fixed expenses, one third are common to both products and one half are directly traceable to the JFlex line. This is information that you don't need to solve the problem. It's just extra stuff given to throw you off. We don't care. All we need to know are the fixed expenses when we're doing CVP. We don't care of the fixed expenses, how much is common to both products versus how much is directly traceable. At least in most CVP problems, we don't, we don't need that. So the first question is, um, compute the sales, or the first requirement is to compute the sales revenue that must be earned for the company to break even. 
Well, we know what that is, right? The sales revenue that must be earned for the company to break even is um, sales of the first product that we need plus sales of the second product. where Q1 star comma Q2 star is the break even point. Remember there are two products here. So if we sell Q1 star units of the JFlex and Q2 star units of the free weights then we will have zero profit. Once we solve for those we can put those in right here and this will give us our break even sales revenue in dollars, right? But we haven't solved for Q1 star, Q2 star. In fact, it's not evident how to solve for it right away. But we don't have to solve for Q1 star and Q2 star actually to find break-even sales revenue. We don't have to find the break-even unit sales to find the break-even dollar sales when we have multiple products. We can use an equation from the lecture notes which is right here. From the lecture notes, I'll go over again. Break even sales dollars, if there's only one product, is this P times Q star. Q star was F over P minus V. Right? But we can rewrite this. So break even sales dollars is P times Q star, Q star, but Q star can be rewritten, so we have P times F over, how can we rewrite P, uh, Q star? Well, we, the denominator P minus V we can rewrite, as we did in the lecture notes. We can take a, take a P out of the denominator, so factor a P out. So. 1 over P, sorry, just take a P out of the denominator, factor a P out. We still need P minus V in the denominator, but if we factor a P out, then we have to do 1 minus V over P, right? We still have P minus V in the denominator, right? This right here is still equal to P minus V. It's P times 1, which is P, minus P times V over P, but the P's cancel. So we still have P minus V in the denominator. We haven't changed the fraction. It's still F over P minus V. We've just rewritten the denominator. Now once we've taken this P out, we have P right here multiplied by all of this, and there's a P down in the denominator. So that's equivalent to just taking P over P times F over 1 minus V over P. The P over P's cancel, and what do we have left? F over 1 minus V over P. 1 minus 1 minus the, the quantity V over P, right? What is 1 minus V over P? That's the contribution margin ratio, which is the same thing as the contribution margin in dollars over the sales in dollars. So you see we have a shortcut here. At least with one product, the break-even sales dollars can be rewritten as just the fixed expenses over the contribution margin ratio. And in fact, this formula holds no matter how many products you have. If you have three products, then the break-even sales dollars, if you have three products, for example, is still F over contribution margin ratio. It's always that because neither one of these things depend on V or P precisely, necessarily. So in the case where we have two products right here, the break-even sales dollars, it's just fixed expenses over the contribution margin ratio. What are the fixed expenses in this problem? They're right here. What's the contribution margin ratio? Contribution margin ratio is just the contribution margin divided by sales. So we have our fixed expenses in the numerator over our contribution margin ratio in the denominator. 
and that's equal to $450,000. So that's the answer to the first part. If we sell $450,000 worth of these two products, we will break even. That's really nice to know that, but it doesn't tell us how much of each product. Because there's infinitely many combinations we can choose to sell $450,000 worth of these two products, right? Do we sell 1,000 units of the... Uh, JFlex, in that case, the JFlex revenue would be 200 times a thousand, or two hundred thousand dollars, and we still got to we still got to sell 250 thousand more dollars, and then I guess that would mean we would sell 250 thousand divided by 75. We'd sell 3,333 units of weight of the free weights, sets of free weights. So is that our combination? A thousand, 3,333. In fact, there's infinitely many combinations. What if we sold 1,001 J-Flexes? Then how many free weights do we have to sell? Well, 1,001 times 200 would be 200,200. And then we subtract that from 450,000. We still have to sell 249,800 worth of the free weights. Divide that by 75. And that means that this would need to be 3,330.67. And in fact, there's infinitely many combinations to get this sales dollars. So the first part is nice to know. We do know that we, we can see that this is the break-even uh, sales dollars total. We've got to sell this many dollars worth of the two products total. But unfortunately, that doesn't tell us how much, how much of each product we should sell to break even. Because there are infinitely many combinations that we can do. So question number two asks us, Compute the number of JFlex machines and, break, and free weight sets that must be sold for them to break even. In other words, of those, uh, of that infinitely many sets of combinations, it's infinitely many um, pairs of Q1, Q2 you can sell. Find the Q1 star, Q2 star, the one that makes you break even. There's infinitely many that make you break even, but you got to pick one. That's what they're asking for. Well. I go over this in lecture notes, and when you have two products, our break, our profit equation will look like this: it's a function of two products. It's uh, P1 Q1 uh, minus V1 Q1 plus P2 Q2 minus V2 Q2. And here, again, don't get confused. Earlier, when I, when I had our change in profit equation, I was saying that the twos represent the new information and the ones represent the old. Not in this case. Now we're in a different context. Now the twos represent the second product and the ones represent the first product. So don't get confused about that. Minus our fixed expenses. We're going to set it equal to zero. Now we can put in what we know. P1 is 200. Q1 we're trying to solve for. We don't know what V1 is yet, but we're gonna we'll actually figure that out here in a second. P2 is 75, Q2 we don't know. V2, Q2. And then the fixed expenses are 157,500. We know that from right here. Set it equal to zero, and we're solving for Q1 and Q2. Let's get V1 and V2 first because we know what those are before we do any solving. How do we get V1 and V2? It says that the JFlex is responsible for 40% of the variable expenses. And it also says that the JFlex is responsible for 40% of the sales revenue. So let's see. Let's first get, we're going to get V1 here in a second. Let's get our projected Q1 and our projected Q2. 
Here's our projected income statement right here. We're going to sell $600,000 worth of these two products. But how many of the JPEX and how many of the sets of free weights does this represent for our projected? Well, it said that JFlex would represent 40% of the revenue. So 40% of the total revenue um, would be the uh, amount of dollars that you would earn on the JFlex, selling the JFlex. And each, so this is the total sales dollars for the JFlex, divided by you sell each one for 200 bucks. So you expect to sell 1,200 JFlexes. And then projected Q2, if JFlex gets 40% of the revenue, then I guess Q2 gets the other 60%. What else is going to get the revenue? There's only two products. Divided by the, uh, the price for that one per per unit, per set of free weights. And it looks like um, we would project to sell 4,800 sets of free weights. So these are, these are our projections for Q1 and Q2. Now we can get our V1. Our variable expenses for the JFlex would be this right here. And we know that that's going to be 40% of the total variable expenses. 40% of the total would be 40% of 390,000. And so this implies that V1, the variable expense per unit for the JFlexes, is the 40% of 390,000 divided by Q1. And Q, our projected Q1 is 1,200. 12, 12, 12, so our V1 then would be, so it must cost us $130 to make each JFlex machine. Similarly, we can find V2. Doing this calculation, V2 equals 0. 60% of the sales revenue. Divided by the number of units, which was I think 4,800, we found up there, here, and that gives um, we sell each set of free or we it costs us 48 dollars and 75 cents to make each set of free weights. So now we have a profit equation. Now we can now we have a true profit equation here. Let's go back and substitute. We have 200. So our profit is a function of Q1 and Q2. So 200 Q1 minus V1 Q1, so minus 130 Q1, plus 75 Q2 minus V2 Q2. V2 is 48.75 Q2. Um, minus 157,500 equals zero. Solve for Q1 and Q2. We're solving for the break-even point, right? Q1 star, Q2 star. But we have one equation and two unknowns, right? We don't know Q1 or Q2. This Q1 and Q2 are our projected Q. These are our projections for Q1 and Q2. If we're going to earn this much profit. But this Q1 and Q2 that we're solving for right here are what Q1 and Q2 need to be if we're going to earn zero profit. So you can't just substitute in 1,200 and 4,800 here. We're solving for Q1 and Q2. That's the question. What is what is the Q1 and Q2 star that makes you earn zero profit? There's infinitely many combinations. We already said that. We need another equation. You have to have at least as many equations as you do unknowns if you even want a chance at solving for the unknowns. But we can get another equation. From our projections, we see that Q1, I'm sorry, Q2, is 4 times Q1. That should hold no matter what level of profit. So here is another equation involving the two unknowns. Now we have two equations and two unknowns, and we can solve for Q1 and Q2. Q1 and Q2. We can get a unique solution for Q1 star, Q2 star. Right? So we can substitute in for Q2. Uh, up here, and right here, we just put 4Q1, because that's what Q2 is, 
And so we're going to have, let's do some simplification. 200Q1 minus 130Q1. That's 70Q1 plus. 75Q2 minus 48.75Q2. That is 26.25Q2. Equals 157,500. We'll just go ahead and put that on that side, right? Now we can substitute in for Q2. Q2 is equal to 4Q1. So we just put that in right there. So really we have 70Q1 plus 26.25 times 4, that's 105 Q1, equals 157,500. And that means 70 plus 105 is 175 Q1, equals 157,500. So that means Q1, we'll call it Q1 star, it's a special Q1, it's the one that makes this profit zero, would be 157,500 divided by uh, 175 or 900 units of the J-flex. And then getting Q, st Q2 star is really easy. We know that Q2 star, Q2 is always four times Q1, whatever the level of profit is, whether it's zero or whether it's our projected profit. So it's four times the 900 equals 3,600 units. All right, so there's our answer to part two the number of J-Flex and, re and free weight sets that must be sold to break even. There are infinitely many combinations, but this is the combination that matches the data that we want. Sell so 900 J-Flexes and 3,600 sets of free weights. Now, we can get at that. I, I, I get at this in the lecture notes, actually. If you go looking at the lecture notes, here in the section on multiple product break-even analysis, multiple products you have an equation there are two unknowns q1 and q2 we always know p1 v1 p2 v2 and f so there's one equation and two unknowns but we have to have another equation so we impose a constraint there are different constraints um, and depending on the context of the problem you might con you might impose this type of a constraint we know these two constraints are always imposed but we got to have another equa another equality equation, right? So depending on the context, it might be this, where there's some total demand, and you can't, it, whatever you make of both products can't exceed the total demand, or else you're not going to sell any of it. So that might be the constraint, or that might be the, the other equation in a certain context, but not in this context. In this context, we have this sort of a equation, where the number of units of Q1 you sell is a multiple of the number of units of Q2 you sell. And if that's the case, I derived some equation. Uh, I derived a general formula for the break-even point, Q2 star, Q1 star. So we can use these actually and verify that we get the same answers as we do here. So in, in this case, we have that our other equation was that Q2 equals 4Q1. But in the lecture notes, I have it written as Q1 equals K times Q2, where K is some positive number. So we want to express Q1 as a function of Q2. Well, Q1 then, if Q2 equals 4Q1, then Q1 equals 1 over 4 times Q2, right? So now we're in the same form as lecture notes, where K equals 1 fourth. Q1 equals K times Q2. K equals a fourth. Now we can solve for Q2 star and Q1 star using these formulas. So Q2 star is F over uh, K times P1 minus V1 plus P2 minus V2, right here. And then Q1 star is just, uh, if Q1 equals a fourth times Q2, then Q1 star equals K. If Q1 equals K times Q2, then Q1 star equals K times Q2 star, right? We can quickly solve for the other one using that. Notice for Q2 star, it's K multiplied by this. It's not, it's not this. It's not K multiplied by the whole denominator. It's just K multiplied by the first part, right? It's just K times this. And then plus 1 times P2 minus V2, right? So careful there. So if we do this, our fixed expenses are 157,500. K is 1 fourth. P1 was 200, V1 was 130, P2 
They charge $75 per weight set. And what does it cost us to make each weight set V2? I think we solved for that up here. Uh, right here. 38.75. So if you solve that equation, you will get Q2 star equals 3,600 units. Exactly what we got when we did this. So just solve this in your calculator and you will get 3,600. And then that means that Q1 star equals K, which is a fourth, times Q2 star, or one fourth times 3,600. And what is one fourth times 3,600? It's just 900. So you get Q1 star equals 900, which is exactly what we got here. So you can use the lecture note formulas to get to derive these answers as well. You just have to put the put it in the same form as in the lecture notes first before using the formulas. All right, and what's next? Part three. Compute the degree of operating leverage for Iron J. Now assume that the actual revenues will be 40% higher than the projected revenues. By what percentage will profits increase with this change in sales volume? Well, we can answer that question by doing the first part. If we compute the operating leverage, we can answer that question. Because the operating leverage gives us insight into answering that question. Let's go to the lecture notes again. Operating leverage. What's the formula and what is it? Operating leverage is contribution margin over profit. It tells us for, um, for every dollar in profit we make, let's see, it helps us answer the question, how does profit change in percentage terms given sales changes by X percent? That's what operating leverage helps us answer. We know that if sales goes changes up or down by, call it X percent, then profit will go in the same direction by X percent, whether up or down, by uh, just multiplying operating leverage times that X percent change in sales. That's what operating leverage tells us. Operating leverage is a unitless number. It's just the number, see it's dollars over dollars, so the dollars cancel. And I guess if you want to be really technical about it, it tells us if, it, if the operating leverage is the contribution margin over the dollars in profit, then it just tells us for every dollar in profit, for every dollar increase in profit, how much um, increase in contribution margin do we get? So let's go ahead and calculate it here. We know the contribution margin in this one is, if we go back to our given information, is uh, 210000 and our profit is 52500 So we're going to do 210 over 52500 and that is exactly 4. And the next question that they ask us is, um, now assume that the actual revenues will be 40% higher than the projected revenues. So instead of getting our um, revenues, instead of earning 600000 this is what we project to earn, we earn 40% more than that. And the question is, uh, by what percentage will profits increase if sales goes up by 40%, basically? If sales is 40% higher than what you project, how much higher is profit going to be percentage-wise than what you projected. Well, we could set up another income statement, see what the new profit would be, and then look at the percentage change. We could do that. Or we could do the shortcut. We could use this formula right here. Operating leverage times percentage change in sales will tell you the percentage change in profit. That's why we calculated operating leverage. So percent change in profit will equal operating leverage times percentage, whoops, not the dollar change, the percentage change, percentage change in sales. 
percentage change in dollar sales. Or four, if sales goes up by 40%, then profit is going to go up by 160%. It's really simple to answer. And then part four, Iron J is considering adding a new product, the J Rider. We'll call that, we'll let Q3 equal the number of units of the J Rider that we sell. So now we have a Q1, Q2. Now profit is a function of this number of units we sell of the J Flex machine, the number of free weights, we sell a number of sets of free weights, and the number of units of of this new J Rider product that we sell. The J Rider is a cross between a rowing machine and a stationary bike. That, that doesn't really matter for the for the purpose of this problem. For the first year, Iron J estimates that the J Rider will cannibalize 600 units of sales from the J Flex. Sales of the free weights will remain unchanged. The J Rider will sell for $180 per unit and have a variable cost per unit of 140. The increase in fixed costs to support this new product is 5700 Compute the number uh, of J-Flex, free weight sets, and J-Riders that must be sold for Iron J to break even. For the coming years, the addition of the J-Rider a good idea? Why or why not? Uh, why might Iron J choose to add the J-Rider anyway? All right. Let's have a look at this. So, we need to get, let's see, let me collect my thoughts. All right, here's our profit equation. 200Q1 minus 130Q1, that's P1Q1 minus V1Q1, plus P2Q2 minus V2Q2. You know this already. Plus P3Q3, the sales for this third product. The price that they're going to charge is 180, and the variable expense per unit is 140. So P, P3Q3 minus V3Q3. They told us 180 and 140 right here. All that, and then minus the variable expenses, but it said, I mean, minus the fixed expenses. And there's going to be an increase of 5,700 in fixed expenses. So whatever fixed expenses we had before, which were uh, 52,000, uh, how many were they? Uh, where are they? Where are they? Where are they? Right here, 157,500. Well, we're now we're going to have that plus. There's an increase of 5,700. So our new fixed expenses then are going to be. 157,500 plus 5,700 or 163,200 is our new fixed expense. So here's our new profit equation. We set it equal to zero and we want to solve for Q1, Q2, Q3. Again, there are three variables and one equation. So there are three unknowns and only one equation. We need at least three equations if we're going to have three unknowns to be able to have a chance of solving for the Q1, Q2, and Q3 that enable us to break even. We do know one equation. One equation is that Q1, uh, I'm sorry, oh, well, hold on, before we do that, what does it tell us about it? This is where we're going to get our equations right here from this information. J Rider will cannibalize 600 units of sales for the J, from the J Flex. So let's look at our projections here. What did we originally project for Q1? Originally it was 1200, right? But now this new product. The J Rider, this third product, is going to take 600 of sales from that product. So this is going to go from 1,200 down to 600. And this is going to be 600. 
and it says sales of the free weights would remain unchanged. And what, what did we project them to be originally? 4,800. Remember our original projections? And where were they? Uh, right here. Now it says that we have a, a third product that are going to cannibalize 600 units of sales from the first product. The first product we're going to only project to get 600 units of sales. The third product we're going to get 600. And it said sales of the second product would not would remain unchanged. Sales of the free weight sets will remain unchanged right here. So this right here gives us the other two equations that we need. So let me see that Q1 equals Q3 at whatever level of profit, including the zero profit level. Q1 should equal Q3, Q1 should equal Q3, and then Q2 should equal 8 times Q1. And if Q1 equals Q3, then that means that Q2 is also 8 times Q3. So we have, we don't even need this equation right here though. We just have, we here, now we have three equations, equation 1, equation 2, equation 3, and the three unknowns we can solve. So in our first equation, wherever you see a Q1, I'm sorry, wherever you see a Q3, put in Q1. So let's simplify the first equation. We have 70 Q1, 200 minus 130, plus 75, uh, sorry, plus 75 Q2 minus 48.75 Q2. What's 75 minus 48.75? We've done this already. 26.25 Q2. 26.25 Q2, but Q2 is 8 times Q1. This is Q2, so we can put that in right there. And then plus 100, and, uh, what's 180 Q3 minus 140 Q2? That's just 40 Q3. But Q3 is equal to Q1, so you might as well just put 40 Q1. And then set all that equal to 163 200. Solve for it's one equation and one unknown. Now we can solve for Q1. 70 Q1 plus 40 Q1, that's 110 Q1, plus this 26.25 times 8, plus 210 Q1, equals 163, 200. And so 110 and 210 is 320 Q1, equals 163, 200. So Q1, we'll call it Q1 star, equals 163, 200 over 320. Or 510 units, 510 JPLEX machines, and Q2 star would be 8 times Q1 star, because Q2 is 8 times Q1. So that means we need to sell 8 times 510, 4,080 sets of free weights, and then Q3 star is equal to Q1 star because Q1 and Q3 are equal always. So that means we also need to sell 510 units of the J-Rider machine. So here's our break-even point in units for each of the three products for part four. Now it says, for the coming year, is the addition of the J-Rider a good idea? Why or why not? Well, to answer the question, is it a good idea? We look at change in profit. That's what we always look at. So, um, let's do that. So let we'll say we'll we'll do it a little bit more formally here. Change in profit. We're going to say it's profit two minus profit one. Profit two equals profit. Before J Rider and profit one equals profit after the addition of the J Rider. So the change is just profit two. Um, sorry, let's do it like this profit two, profit after the J Rider minus profit one, profit before. If it's positive, we say yes, it was a good idea. If it's negative, we say no. What's profit two? We know profit two before the J Rider. I'm sorry, profit one before the J Rider. What's profit one? That would be our projected profit before we added the J Rider. 
which would have been uh, 52,500 right here. Now, what's profit two, the profit after ad adding the J Rider? Well, we just use our um, profit equation, right? Here's our profit equation right here. So we're going to have 70 times Q1 plus 26.25 times Q2. So the profit after adding the J rider would be 70 Q1 plus 26.25 times Q2 plus, and then this is 180 Q3 minus 140 Q3. So it's plus 40 Q3 minus 163 200. Here's our profit after the J rider. And um, what was our, after adding the J rider, what did we expect? What was our forecasted Q1, Q2, and Q3? Well, we thought Q1 would be 600 units. Q2 would be 4,800 units. It wouldn't change. And Q3 would be 600 units. Remember that? And then we subtract our 163, 200. So our profit after adding the J rider would be 70 times 600 plus 26.25 times 4,800. Plus uh, 40 times 600, that's 192,000 minus 163, 200, 28,800. So what's our change in profit? Our change in profit is our profit after the proposed change minus the profit before the proposed change, or 52,500 minus 28,800. No, sorry. Our profit. Our change in profit is our profit after the proposed change. After adding the J rider, we would make 28,800. That's profit two. Minus our profit before the proposed change. If we didn't add the J rider, we would be making 52,500. So our change is negative. And you can calculate the difference. 23,700. And so the answer to the question is, is the addition of the J rider a good idea? No, because change in profit is negative, because profit will go down. The final question is, why might the company add the J-Rider even though they expect profit will go down in that first year? And to answer this, you got to think more long-term. Yes, short-term, you might lose profit. But um, sales might grow, right? In the first year, it said sale, they expected sales to cannibalize, the J-Rider would cannibalize 600 units of sales from the J-Flex machine. But that's just the first year. Maybe sales will grow for the J-Rider. Um, or maybe sales for the J-Flex machine will continue, will not be, continue to be cannibalized by the J-Rider. Maybe they're not um, substitutes for each other. Right? It seems like they're substitutes, in a sense. If, they, uh, if, the sales for, if you introduce a third product and the sales for your first product just cut in, cuts in half, and all the other sales go to that third product. It seems like they're basically perfect substitutes, but maybe they're really not. If you give it more time, maybe sales for the J-Flex machine will continue to go up and won't be cannibalized by sales for the J-Rider. And also the J-Rider sales will go up. Um, also the variable cost for the J-Rider per unit. Remember the, uh, the V3. It costs us $140 to make each J-Rider. That seems a little high. It costs us $130 to make each J-Flex and it only costs 48.75 to make each set of free weights. So this was a V1 and a V2. So this seems kind of high. If we can lower that, then that will also, even though profit's negative now, you know, it, we expect it to be negative in, in the first year. Um, after that, if the sales for the J, J Rider continue to rise and the ones for the uh, J Flex don't, get cannibalized, they also continue to rise, and we can control the variable expense per unit for the J-Rider, we can maybe make that go down a little bit, then it might be a good idea to 
to go ahead and introduce this new product. Yes, we experience a loss in the first year as a result, but maybe profit will be higher than we could otherwise experience selling just two products going ahead than if we introduce this third one and we sell three. There are a lot of other things that you need to think about um, rather than just what will happen in the short term uh, in deciding whether you should introduce an, a new product to the company. So that concludes the video on cost, volume, profit analysis.